And I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. I don't know about you, but when you look around the world today, specifically our own country, you wonder how we're going to survive. You wonder how we're going to last. You wonder how bad things might get. You look around at our, our country. You look around at our government. You look around at uh, all of the chaos that's going on in a moral sense, in a political sense. And the question that keeps coming up is what could possibly help What could possibly turn? Is it voting for the right person? Who even is that? Is it voting for the right legislation? Would legislation help dictate our own morality? What could potentially bring about a transformation in our country? Brothers and sisters, the answer is very clear in the Bible. It's the gospel that brings about transformation in the hearts of those who would hear and receive it and brings about a repentance that is clear, is defined, and is obvious for the world to see. There's a word that gets thrown around a lot. It's kind of a buzzword today in evangelicalism, and it's revival, right? We're always praying for revival. May revival happen. That's not a bad thing to pray for. But if all we're saying is God bring revival, and then we don't do the work of the ministry to go out and to share the gospel with those that need to hear it, revival's not going to happen. Even in our own country, way back close to the formation of it, which doesn't seem too far away, at the apex of the Great Awakening, a time when revival was just permeating uh, the eastern side of America. Even at that moment, as the preaching of God's word was, was going forth through men like Jonathan Edwards, who were preaching the gospel with clarity, with conviction, At that point, though there was a huge awakening and revival was absolutely happening, only about 15 to 20 percent of the population in our country at that time came to the Lord. What's the biggest revival that's ever happened in the history of the world? What's the biggest revival? We're going to see it this morning. Jonah chapter 3, in Nineveh, we see the greatest awakening and the greatest revival that's ever happened. The entirety of the city gets saved. But how? The word is repentance. They are repentant. Even in my Bible, the heading for chapter 3 is Nineveh repents. What does that mean? What does repentance look like? Is it sorrow over sin? It is, but there's a difference between sorrow and salvation. Is it remorse over your guilt? It is, but there's a difference between remorse and repentance. Martin Luther The very first of his 95 theses, which he nailed to that door, the the church door in Wittenberg, uh, to say, we need to reform the teaching that's going on from the Bible. It wasn't even from the Bible, it was from tradition. But he said, repentance is the whole of the Christian life. Every single day, it's not a one moment in time, we just repent, we move on, and that's life, and we're saved. No, repentance is the life of the believer. Repent, the word repent, appears four times in verses 8 through 10 in chapter 3. It's the central theme of this entire chapter. And so what I want us to do is just go through the whole chapter, and I want us to see four features of repentance. I'm tempted to put true repentance, four features of true repentance, but the reality is if you are not truly repentant, it's not repentance. It's just remorse over sin. So four features of repentance. Four features of real, biblical, genuine repentance. See if you can see them as we read through this, ch- this chapter. Ro- uh, Jonah chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose. He went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Jonah began to go through the city, one day's walk, and he cried out and he said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed in God. And they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them when the word reached the king of Nineveh. 
He arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe from him. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat on ashes. And he issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Don't let them eat or drink water. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, and God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Father, I pray that you would bring about repentance in our church family, in those that might be watching through the live stream, bring about repentance as we see clearly from this text what it looks like, how it's lived out, and why it's worth it. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Four features of repentance. Four features that we see in chapter 3. The first is that repentance always begins when you're confronted by the Word of God. Repentance always begins when you're confronted by the word of God. This is verses one through four in chapter three. So verses one through four gives gives us the first feature of repentance. It it cannot start unless you're confronted with the word of God. You need the word of God to confront you. This is uh, verse one. We'll start there. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This is grace. That any one of us gets a second time is grace. And we haven't been given a second time. We have been given so many chances. Some people, as they read the book of Jonah, they're confused about Jonah because they wonder, and it's a good question, is Jonah converted at the beginning of the book? Is he a believer when the book starts? Is he converted in the fish? Is he converted at the end? Is he even saved at all? What's up with this prophet? It's a great question to ask. We might tackle it later on in our study of this book, but I just, I want to say, I think the counter to that confusion of Jonah and his consistent uh, wobbling back and forth, I'll do, I don't want to do, I don't want to do, okay, I'll do. My, My counter to that question is just simply look at your own life, right? Look at your own life. Were you perfectly obedient after your conversion? Does, does God ever have to tell you things twice? Look at your own life. Just in verse 1, we already see a magnificent principle of God's grace, which is the theme of this whole book. And that principle is this. God uses people who have forfeited their right to be used. God uses people who have forfeited their right to be used. If he didn't do that, I can tell you this much, this pulpit would be empty. God uses people who have completely forfeited their right to be used by him. In God's grace, he sends his word over and over again and speaks to us a second, third, fourth, five thousandth time. This is encouraging because that means failure is never final in our lives. Failure does not mean that God won't necessarily use you in the future. And there's no finality of action that can't be turned around by the grace of Jesus. I love the grace of God so clear on display in verse 1, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah the second time. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim it to the, proclaim the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. Now, we don't know how long it took for Jonah to get the word from the Lord this second time after he was spit up by the fish. We don't know the time frame between Jonah being in the fish and Jonah getting this message again from the Lord. We do know exactly how much time elapses between God giving him the word and Jonah obeying it. And that is zero seconds. Jonah knows, I have to do exactly what God says because it didn't work well for me the last time. I chose not to do it. So he gets up and he goes. Verse 3, Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh instantly, according to the word of the Lord. 
Nineveh is an exceedingly great city, verse 3 says. It's a three days journey. It's a, it's a magnificent city. It's about 60 miles in circumference. It's huge. It would take you three days to walk through the whole thing. And Jonah preaches the message that God had given him to preach. And he goes only one day's journey into the city. He doesn't get all around the city. He goes just one day in. Verse 4, and he cries out and he says, Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. He preached the threat of divine judgment. He preached it loudly. He preached it clearly. You have 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. One commentator says it this way, Jonah did not become free to select for himself what he would say to men. He did not go to them to tell them about his experiences. He did not decide the content of his preaching. Thus, our witness is fast bound to the word of God. The greatest saint can say nothing of value unless it's based solely on God's word. He has to speak the message that God has given for him to speak. Literally, if you go back in verse 2, proclaim to it, to the city, the proclamation which I'm going to give to you. In Hebrew, it's speak the speech I speak to you. I'm giving you the words. You just speak my words. You don't get to speak your own words, Jonah. And the reason is Jonah's not going to save anybody. Jonah's words can't save anybody. Only God's words can save people. You and I don't change people. God's the one who does the change. God's not calling Jonah to do something that he can't do. God's calling Jonah to be a part of something that only God can do. I don't know if you do this in discipleship, where you feel like I am the one that's in charge of changing somebody's heart. You hear behavior that they're involved in, and you wonder, okay, how am I going to go about fixing this issue? Brothers and sisters, you and I don't change anyone. We don't change anyone. We simply bring the message of God to them, and God changes them. If they would be repentant, if they would be humble, if they would receive the message of God, God changes people. We don't change people. By the way, this is applicable to every area of life. Parents, can I just encourage you? I don't know if you struggle with this. I wake up, I load the spiritual burden of my kids' hearts being changed on my shoulders, and I go throughout the day thinking, I need to fix my kid's heart. That's why I go to bed at night super angry, very frustrated, and feeling like a failure because I didn't change anything. But that's not my job. If you're a parent here this morning, I just want to encourage you, take that burden off. That's the wrong job. Your job description is not changing your kids. Your job description is taking the word of God to your kids and letting God change them. Pray for them on your knees every day. Pray for them, but let God do the changing. Do what you're called by God to do. And trust God to do what he does. I don't know if you noticed it in verse 4. Jonah's message. Yet 40 days in Nineveh will be overthrown. Will be. There's no possibility that they're going to receive grace in Jonah's mind. Jonah will be destroyed. You've got 40 days. Jonah, uh, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's all. You, you don't have any option. You're going to be killed. And I wonder... If he wants that to happen, I believe he enjoys preaching wrath. He enjoys this aspect of God's wrath. He wants them to be destroyed. In 40 days, what's the significance of 40 days? Just that it's one more than 39. They have one more day. They have one more day to repent. But notice how much grace Jonah has received. And now he's going to give grace to the city of Nineveh But the grace that Jonah received hasn't even gone to his bones yet. He's not preaching, repent, because I know that God can save and give grace. He gave it to me. He doesn't want to extend grace to others. But he shares the word that God has given him to share. And that's the first aspect of repentance. You cannot repent unless you've heard God's word just like Nineveh could not repent until they heard Jonah speak the word of God. So can I ask you, has the word of God confronted you? Has it confronted you in such a way that you've turned and you've repented? Have you heard God's call over your life that you are not your own? That you are owned by him? 
Does the word still confront you to this day? Do you want to know how you can make sure, 100% sure, that you'll never repent? Here's how you can make sure you'll never repent. Just never open the word and never place yourself under the word. Never be confronted by the word and you'll never repent. You need the word in order to bring about repentance. And can I just, I want to plead with you right here, right now. I believe it's the, the tone of Jonah's message. I believe it's biblical. I believe it's exactly what God would have me say right now. Friends, you need to repent because you might only have 40 days before your own death. And if you don't repent before 40 days is up, you might die in an unrepentant state and forever be separated from God for all of eternity. You are a sinner who needs to turn and you may only have 40 days to do it. That's the first aspect of repentance. The word of God must confront you in order for repentance to be possible. Secondly, the second feature of repentance is that repentance reaches the heart. Repentance reaches the heart. This is, verses, this is verse 5. Repentance reaches the heart. Once you're confronted with the word, the word of God is going to go into your heart and change you from the inside out. God has told Nineveh, in 40 days, my guillotine is going to drop over your head. How would you respond to that message? How have you responded to that message? Well, look at how Nineveh responds. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed in God. They believed on that first day. They didn't take any more time. They believed in the message that was being given to them. You remember Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, with the heart, uh, uh, somebody believes with their heart, right? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, one believes. Belief is not just in your mind. Uh, this is, I think, where most people misunderstand the idea of, I believe in God. Well, everybody believes that there is a God, or they, they know there's a God. They, they have evidence that there's a God. Whether they choose to, to accept it or not is up to them. But everybody knows that there is a God. So to simply say, I believe that he's there, that he exists. Biblically, that's not enough to be saved. Or to simply say, I agree with the historical facts of the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose from the dead. I agree that that happened. I believe that that happened. That's not saving faith. Saving faith involves three aspects. You have to know true facts. You have to believe that those facts are true. But then you have to press deeper into those facts, those realities, and say they apply to me, and I treasure them. I love them. That's why I say repentance reaches the heart. It doesn't just go into your mind. Repentance goes deep into your heart where you say, I know certain historical facts, and I believe that they're true. They actually happened. But it goes so much beyond that. I mean, the demons do that, right? The demons know Jesus died on the cross for sinners. The demons believe that that's true. They were there. But are they saved? No. What brings about salvation? Not knowing, not believing it's true, but giving your life to it. You remember the, the parable in Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. It's one of my favorite parables in the whole Bible, where a man finds a treasure hidden in the field, goes back home, sells everything that he has to go get that treasure. The treasure is Christ. The man could see the treasure in the field. He has to know that there's treasure there, right? That's knowledge. You have to know certain facts, and he sees that there's treasure. He knows it. And then he could believe that that could be his he could believe it's actually there and it could be his. But until he goes home and gives away everything that he has to go back and buy that, to say, this is better than everything I have at home, unless he does that, he's not in possession of that treasure. And unless you turn from your sin and you trust in Jesus Christ, then you don't have evidence that your heart has been changed, that you have said, Jesus is better than all these things. So repentance is a change in emotion. So they believe, but all wrapped up in belief, believing facts, believing they're true, but treasuring those facts to be true. Repentance changes your emotions, your affections, your desires, your will. Why did they believe? They believed because they experienced guilt and shame. They experienced sorrow over hurting others around them. The world will tell you, by the way, guilt is bad and shame is bad. Don't think about that. That's really bad. 
The Bible says guilt is actually a gift from the Lord. Psalm 32. Your hand was heavy upon me, God, until I repented. Don't excuse your sin. Stop letting people make you feel bad that you feel bad. Hey, stop feeling shame. Stop feeling guilt. Don't feel that. Feel guilt and shame. Let that press into you a sense of, I need to turn. We saw this even in the book Conscience when we studied it. There are certain things that our conscience is crying out saying, you shouldn't have done that, and we shouldn't have done that. And so they feel guilt, they feel shame, they receive a message that God is angry with them for their sins, and they go, of course he is. I know that. And they believe the message. There's no complaining. Genuine repentance doesn't complain. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Genuine repentance says, whatever consequences I deserve, I deserve them, and probably even more so. And whatever it takes for me to turn, it has a zeal for doing what's right, for vindicating its own wrongdoing. It's very interesting to note historically. I, I believe God prepared Nineveh to hear this message. In the year, 600, or in the year 765 B.C., you remember B.C. is going to count backwards to zero, right? That's how it moves forward in its chronology. In the year 765 B.C., Nineveh had been hit by a massive plague and thousands and thousands had died. The next year, 764, there was a huge famine and more had died. The next year, 763, there was a total solar eclipse, which for them was a sign of judgment from that perspective. And then in 762, there was a massive revolt against the king, and the king took up residence in a different palace to be safe and decided, I'm not doing anything about what you're revolting over. A few years later after that, Jonah arrives and says, God's angry with you. And the Ninevites are like, of course he is. Look at the plague. Look at the famine. Look at the solar eclipse. Look at our king being wicked, not doing anything. Of course he is. And is there any hope? Then comes along this man. What must he have looked like? In the you know, cartoon version in my mind of Jonah walking out of the fish and onto dry land and going into Nineveh, he's sharing this message in 40 days, and then he has to do this to get water out, and you know, Nineveh will be, and he coughs up some seaweed. Like, th what would this man have looked like? Maybe he's bleached from the stomach acid of the fish, Probably doesn't smell too good. And so there's questions. This is why Jesus says that there is a sign of Jonah. Not just the message of Jonah, but a sign. Look at him. He is a sign. As he's walking around in Nineveh, people are going, what happened to you? Why do you look like this? Why do you smell like that? And he gets to share the sign of Jonah. I was told by God to come to you to speak a message I disobeyed, and God had grace upon me to save me and to bring me here to you. Jonah is a sign of God's grace because though the Ninevites were evil, they were wicked, and they were rebels deserving of death, guess who else was an evil, wicked rebel deserving of death? Jonah. And he is still here, standing in front of the Ninevites. He's still alive. So if he can live after his defiance, then surely we can live after our defiance. That's what Nineveh sees. That's the sign of Jonah. Jonah. What about in your life? Are there people in your life who are ripe for the gospel? And I, I think there's just no better time in our life. This is a weird time. I know that. I understand that. And I can't wait to get out of it. But this season of, of COVID, this season of fires all over the place, smoke in the air, this season of who knows if you could die from any of these things, this season brings uncertainty and death right to our doorstep think the people around us that we're able to interact with are ripe for the gospel. They're ripe to hear. There's hope. Death is imminent, not just physically, but spiritually and eternally, but there's hope, and I'm living proof that there's hope because God hasn't struck me dead yet. What about you? Do you believe this way? Do you believe like the Ninevites believe? They're going to not only just take that message, internalize it, they don't just believe it's true, they also act accordingly. They treasure the God who brings them that message to give them grace. Do you believe that way? Or is your belief just simple mental assent? You agree with facts. 
That's not saving faith. Number three, the third feature of repentance. Repentance not only begins with a confrontation from the Word of God. Secondly, it reaches the heart. Belief goes deep into the heart. But number three, repentance changes the behavior. Thirdly, repentance changes the behavior. It goes deep into your heart, and then it works from the inside out to change your behavior. This is verses 6 through 8, and really the end of verse 5. They believe in God, and then the end of verse 5, middle of verse 5, they call a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. This is an external sign of their sorrow, their, their guilt, their shame. And then it doesn't stop with them. Verse 6, when word reaches the king of Nineveh, he arises from his throne, he lays aside his robe, and he covers himself with sackcloth and sits on ashes. He too sees the guilt and the shame, and he says, we need to do something. It doesn't just stay in the heart. It moves to the actions and the behavior. The king knows that they're worthy of this death. Verse 8, he's going to give specific name to the sin. Let everybody turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. It's not just, we've done bad things. It's calculated. It's specific. I know the evil that I've done. He names it. And he calls for the entire city to repent of the sin that they so love. By the way, just a side note. This king is an example to us as leaders. Leaders must model what the people need to do and need to become. He's going to stand up and say, let's do this. I mean, they already got it started, and then he's going to go deeper into that and model for them. As one pastor says, this king is a portrait as a leader of the desired destination of his people. He's the portrait of where the people want to get to. And so the, re the king repents. The king repents. The, s the nobility repents. The whole community repents. Even the animals repent. If you go down in uh, verse 7, he issues a proclamation and he says, in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, don't let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Don't let them eat or drink water. Both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let us call earnestly on the Lord. Even the animals are involved in this. This is such thorough repentance that we're putting sackcloth and ashes on sheep. I've preached sermons before where people have professed faith in Jesus Christ. I've never preached one sermon where somebody comes up to me and says, my dog Fifi received Jesus and has turned from their wicked ways. That's what's happening in Nineveh. It's so total. It's so overwhelming that every single person, even the animals, seem to be changing. This is massive repentance. This is revival. But notice the behavioral change. It's not just put on sackcloth and ashes. Notice how calculated this is. And think with me on what's going to happen based off of this type of behavior. The king says 40 days. For 40 days we won't eat or drink, even the animals. So if you don't drink for 40 days, you're going to die. The Ninevites are saying, we would rather die in our desperation than be destroyed by God. We'd rather repent than face God in his judgment. Uh, imagine just what the animals would have looked like on day five of this fasting from eating and from drinking. Many of the animals would die. Their economy would weaken. But the Ninevites don't care. Who cares if our economy is tanked? I just want to be genuine in my repentance. I don't care what I lose. They don't even stop to eat in their mourning and repentance. There's no taking a break from repenting. There's no whining about their repentance. When the heart is engaged, there's no whining. Their robes are exchanged for sackcloth, dignity for disgust and distress. A throne, heap is ex a throne is exchanged for an ash heap, no longer sovereign but submissive. These are all displays of guilt and of repentance. Reformation is specific when repentance is real. This isn't just, I need to change. Let's talk specifically about what needs to change. And their repentance could cost them everything. True repentance does. True repentance, like that man in Matthew 13, I'll give away everything to have Christ. Or like Zacchaeus, what a great example in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 19. You have a man who says, I know that I've defrauded people. Whoever I've defrauded, fourfold I'm going to get back, and I'm giving half of my possessions to the poor. I'm just giving away everything I've got. 
True repentance costs you everything. This repentance that's true reaches the heart and affects the behavior. Everyone turns. The only question now is, is God going to turn? Is God going to turn? That leads us to the fourth and final feature of repentance. Repentance, number one, begins with the confrontation with the word of God. Repentance, number two, reaches the heart. Repentance, number three, affects the behavior, radically changes who you are. Finally, number four, repentance is a gift from God. Repentance is a gift from God. I think verse nine is probably the most important verse in this chapter. The king says, who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we won't perish, but God might not. Now that tells you the motivation of their repentance. They are not saying, let's repent in order to get God to not destroy us. They're saying, we are repenting no matter what. We still deserve punishment. We still deserve wrath. We still deserve to be destroyed. That doesn't change. We're, we're repenting from our sin, and who knows? Maybe God will show us grace, but whether he does or not doesn't mean we're changing our repentance. This is the most important aspect of this chapter. He doesn't expect anything. He definitely doesn't demand anything. The king puts himself in a position of dependence upon God to extend mercy to whoever God wants to extend mercy to. God may, but he may not. God is under no obligation to grant mercy or grace to anybody. The king is in effect saying, we deserve what we're getting. We don't deserve God to relent. And that's the heart of real repentance. I know so many people that repent in order to get rid of the consequences around them. They repent, hoping that in their repentance, God will remove the consequences. And when they realize that the consequences aren't going away, they stop their repentance. I repented in order to get consequences to go away. They're not going away. Then I'm done with my repentance. That shows you that's not real repentance. That's repentance to try and move God to act in a certain way. You just are sorry that you're, you're getting bad consequences. Get those away. I'll do whatever that takes. Not so in Nineveh. This man knows that the mercy that he's asking for is altogether undeserved. So he's not saying, let's repent in order to get God to do something. He's saying, we deserve it. Who knows what God's going to do? But regardless of what he chooses to do, we're going to repent. You don't say this, you don't speak this way when you're expecting something from God or you feel you've earned something from God. That maybe by your performance or by your repentance, you've earned God's grace. You don't talk this way. That's why I love this man. This king is amazing. He has only guilt. There's nothing in his life that could be used as leverage to say, look at how amazing I am. You owe it to me, God, to forgive me. This man knew that the mercy that he's praying for is God's gift to give if God wants to give it. But this king has hope. He's staring at a prophet who deserves God's wrath and that prophet's alive. And so he has hope. Maybe, maybe God sent this prophet. Maybe he kept him alive for this specific reason. Why would he leave Jonah alive? Why didn't God just kill him? Maybe there's hope for us. Maybe he's giving us an opportunity to repent. But he knows it's God's gr grace and forgiveness is God's to give. Just write down 2 Timothy 2. Verse 25, 2 Timothy 2.25 says this, Repentance is always a work of God. It's God doing the work in your heart. It's a gift from Him. Let me just say it this way. There's just simply nothing worse than a Christian who walks through life with a sense of deserving. There's just nothing worse than that. Repentance has no disposition of entitlement. That's the opposite of humility. So can I ask you, do you know how undeserving you are? This is why the message of the gospel is so offensive to people who think they're deserving. How dare you tell me I'm deserving only of wrath? You're telling me I'm undeserving of forgiveness? I'm a nice guy. I'm a nice person. I'm a good person. Christian arrogance should never exist. So this man, even though he knows 
Maybe God will still destroy us. We're still going to repent. We're going to repent. We're going to do the right thing. That tells me there's transformation, by the way. You don't repent in order to get saved, right? You don't repent, turn, now look at me, God, save me. If you are repentant, then that's evidence that God in his grace has given you a new heart. And that only comes to the preaching the word of God. So God in his grace brought these people the word. They get saved, and their repentance is an evidence of their salvation. What's God going to do? Verse 10. When God sees their deeds, he sees the evidence of their transformation. He sees the evidence of their new hearts. They turn from their wicked way. Then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared that he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Mark it down, brothers and sisters. God is so much more ready to forgive you than you're ready to repent. God is so much more ready to forgive you than you're ready to repent. He relents. He loves giving mercy and grace. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn and live. He loves showing mercy to sinners. But the issue is, do you want it? Do you want the mercy that he's offering? He's eager to give mercy to those who are wanting it. He's eager to give mercy to those who respond. Some people say, well, doesn't, doesn't God forgive everybody? Why do I have to believe in him? He's nice and he forgives everybody. Forgiveness is possible. It's an offer to everybody. But he doesn't just forgive everybody. I mean, just think about it. If I went up to Josh, our, our new member, and I said, hey, Josh, good to see you. Hey, I, I forgive you. Josh goes, oh, f- uh, thanks. What, what? What did I do? It's okay, man. Don't worry about it. I forgive you. What, what, did, what did I do? You, you're, you're saying you forgive me for something. I don't remember what it is that I did. And I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. He's going to go home and go, that Patrick is a weird dude. <laughs> and he's going to go through his brain, go, wait, through his thoughts, through his days, what did I do? I didn't do anything. I don't understand. And Josh won't do this because Josh is a really nice guy. But some people, if they heard that, they'd go, how dare Patrick say he forgives me? How dare he say that? I I didn't do anything to offend him. He is easily offended. He's easily hurt. He's got a problem. He needs to get over it. But I didn't do anything. You realize that's exactly what happens with the Lord, right? He's offering forgiveness. I forgive you. I forgive you. And if somebody does not think that they need that forgiveness, they're going to go, how dare he say I did anything to offend him? That's why the message of the gospel is so difficult to hear. You've offended God. Excuse me, I'm not a bad person. So God gives mercy, but he gives mercy and forgiveness. He he loves to give that to people who are saying, could you please forgive me? Yes, instantly. I've already made a way. He loves to give mercy, but People who don't think that they need mercy, people who don't think they need forgiveness, they're not going to ask for it, and God's not going to give it to them. But he loves to give mercy. Martin Luther said, judgment is God's strange work. Mercy is his common work. God loves giving mercy. He has to be righteous in judgment, but that's not what he loves more than anything. He loves giving mercy more than anything. Just think about Luke chapter 15, right? The father in the story of the prodigal son, is running down. He can't wait to show mercy to his son. He's not back up there on his front porch with his arms crossed saying, let's see if he grovels before me. No, he loves his son. By the way, does this change in God's mind? I'm going to relent. I'm going to give you punishment, but no, now I'm going to relent. Does it undermine his integrity? And I use that word change because obviously in God's mind, God never changes. Perspectively, from our vantage point, he says, I'm going to destroy you, and then I'm not. So does that change undermine his integrity? No. The character of God never changes. His ultimate aim was always to give mercy. That's why he's sending Jonah. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 7 through 8, reads this. This is God speaking. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it, But if that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I'll relent concerning the calamity that I plan to bring it. God's will was perfectly perfectly clear beforehand. 
I love how one commentator says it this way. I, I couldn't come up with such a genius way to say this. The purpose for God's anger is for its own disappearance. I'm angry with you just so that I can remove that and let the anger disappear. So were God not to change here, would mean that he has no integrity. He promised if you have a transformed heart and turn and trust me, then that calamity goes away. If he doesn't change, that means he doesn't have any integrity, and this change absolutely establishes his integrity. But I, I have one more question, and we'll wrap these things up. What about Nineveh's guilt and sin? You remember, these are the Assyrians to the north. They've sent some people into Israel, and probably... Some Israelite knows a family member who was brutally murdered by the Ninevites. You remember some of the despicable things that they did to the people that they captured. Does God just turn a blind eye? Is God just in relenting? Is he righteous in saying, I forgive you? Think about the person, the family member that, that you know who was murdered by the Assyrians, and you go, God, you have to punish that. That's guilty, that's evil, that's wicked. How could you just turn a blind eye to it? God is just in relenting. Why? Because he just turns a blind eye? No. His holy anger was turned in a different direction. As it is about to be poured out on Nineveh, and they with transformed hearts say, we repent, that anger is turned and put on Jesus. This is Romans chapter 3. God pours his wrath out on Jesus so that he can cleanse the sins that have been formerly committed. And he's done that with you and with me. So the whole city responds. About 600,000 people in this city are saved whole city. This is revival. Brothers and sisters, if it happened back then, it could happen today. You and I are a bunch of walking Jonas. We are signs of grace. And we are called to go into the world and to declare to the world, you can be saved. Yet 40 days and God's wrath is coming, but you can be saved. So, how do we wrap this chapter up? Just two points in conclusion. Two, two points. Number one, do not delay in your repentance. Don't delay in your repentance. Don't think, I have time. You don't know if you have time. John chapter 3, verse 36. You remember John 3, right? We say John 3, 16. That's the verse, most well-known verse in the Bible. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's a beautiful gospel verse. If you just go to the end of the chapter, Verse 36, John 3, 36 says, the wrath of God abides on those who are not saved. It abides on you now. Therefore, the call to repent is not a suggestion, it's a command. And to deny that call is not to decline, but to defy. The, the command to repent is a command that demands immediate obedience. One Puritan pastor, Thomas Manton, said this, quote, You can plead things. You can hope God will be merciful to you later. You can indulge yourself a little longer in your sin, but you cannot bend his mercy and make it save. Would you take poison out of hope that afterwards you might meet with an antidote? This is the very case between God and us. Whoever delays in his repentance does, in effect, pawn his soul to the devil and leaves it in his hands and says, here, Satan, keep my soul. If I come back and get it again by such and such a day or by such and such a day, then so be it. If you delay your repentance, that's what you're saying. You're saying, here, Satan, have my heart, have my soul. We'll see if I come back for it. There's only one thing worse in life than refusing to repent. When it comes to repentance, there's only one thing worse in life than refusing to repent. And it's repenting without being serious about change. Repenting without being serious about change. Remorse that does not issue in repentance is just self-destruction. I'm sorry for what I did wrong, but if it doesn't lead you to radical repentance and radical amputation, it just brings about self-destruction. 
I've been in ministry long enough to see this occur in people's lives. The cycle of remorse over sin, I feel guilty, I'm sorry, no real radical change, no heart transformation, and just self-destruction forever. So therefore, I plead with you today, repent today. I love how the old Puritans used to say, sue God for mercy. Just go to him in his courts and plead with him. Don't leave until you say, God, I need a transformed heart. This is what I pray every day with my kids. Oh, their sin is so evident. <laughs> and I sit down with them and I say, what do you need to do? And they, need, they say, I need to stop being angry or I need to stop being impatient or I need to stop doing whatever it is. That's so obvious. And in tears I say, can you make that happen? Can you stop? And they know the answer is no, I need a new heart. We're constantly praying with our kids, God, please. Please give them a new heart. I don't even know if they're at a place right now in their age or maturity where they're praying that prayer with sincerity. I know I'm praying it with sincerity over them. And I pray one day they will. But my friends, you and I can. You and I can plead with God. Change my heart. I'm sick of my sin. And even if I died tomorrow, under your just wrath. I wouldn't care because I deserve it and I just want to get rid of sin. No matter the consequence, no matter the discipline, no matter the punishment, I just am done with sin. So what do you do? Don't, don't delay in your repentance, number one. And then secondly, run to Jesus. Cling to Christ. We have a greater sign than Jonah, right? That's why Matthew 12 exists. Jesus says there's a sign that's greater than the sign of Jonah here in your midst. And it's a crucified and risen Savior. This side of the cross, we know the answer to the question, will God relent? Will God allow us uh, to, to enjoy grace and mercy? Will God forgive? We know the answer to that question because we have a Savior who is crucified and is now risen at the right hand of the Father. The answer is he will forgive if you will go to him. Turn from sin. Trust in Christ. Charles Spurgeon said, I don't know when I'm more perfectly happy than when I'm weeping for my sins at the foot of the cross. When I get to heaven, I can't wait to talk to an Ninevite, one of the 600,000 that got saved. Can't wait to talk to them. And I'm going to ask, how did you come to the place of salvation? They'd say something like, I was so wrapped up in my sin. I love my sin. We were so wicked. We were so vile. And then one day, this smelly, stinky prophet came. It was disgusting. He had bleached white skin, and yet he came and he spoke on behalf of God. We'd never seen anything like it. He's kind of a weirdo. Told us he'd been in the belly of a fish for three days and was spit up on the land to tell us to turn from sin and trust in God. I heard his message, I believed his message, and God saved me. And then he might turn to me and say, what about you? How would you come to a place of salvation? I would say, my story is not very different. I loved my sin. I was wrapped up in my sin. But then one day, I read about a prophet. Most people thought he was a weirdo. And he wasn't in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. He was actually in the ground dead for three days. And God raised him to newness of life. He claimed to be God. He is God. And he died on the cross for my sins. He pr provided a, a message of salvation that I could be saved and forgiven and be eternally his. I heard that message. I believed it. And God saved me. I wish the book ended in chapter 3. If this were a book that were made by men, that wasn't a book by God, then it would have ended in chapter 3. That's the story, right? Defiant prophet, God saves him, delivers a message of salvation. Hooray, everybody gets saved. But chapter 4 is the main reason why this book was written. So we're going to come back next week and start dialoguing about chapter 4, the reason why this book is in the Bible. But as I pray, I just want to, I want to remain in chapter 3. And I want to ask you, do you have business to do with God today? Do you have repenting to do today? Don't wait, don't delay, and cling to Christ alone. Let's pray.